All right. Uh, thank you for joining for the, thank you for joining us for this Hagley History Hangout. I'm Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society in the Hagley Museum and Library. And I am pleased to be joined today by Bernardo Batiz Lazo, Professor of FinTech History and Global Trade at Northumbria University. Uh, hi, Bernardo. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, uh, Gregory, for having me. It's always been great to collaborate and to engage with, with the Hackney Museum. Um, and well, uh, I'll give a little bit of additional information to our audience. Uh, Bernardo has conducted research at uh, Hagley support, with support from the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society. And his book, Cash and Dash, How ATMs and Computers Changed Banking, examines the development and adoption of automatic teller machines. Uh, from an international perspective, and the subsequent impacts had by this technological change on the organization and operation of the financial services industry over a span of several decades. Um, so I'm excited to talk about the book uh, with its author as well as his additional work. Um, uh, so, so thanks once again for joining me. Uh, and my first question for you, what is FinTech? Well, that's something that I've been trying to define for some time now. I think that it depends who you ask. Mm. He will tell you something. For me, it's the adoption of computers in financial technology. But certainly in a more recent or contemporary focus, it also involves the startup of, of um, startup companies that are primarily using uh, computer applications in trying to disintermediate, disintermediate banks. Uh, primarily uh, other financial institutions that you also have them in, for example, in, in insurance and, and whatever have you. Uh, but the, the term is really broad and, and really um, loose in, ter in, in, in its terms. Yeah? So uh, for instance, um, some, some people would think that the first, um, which is part of FinTech, the first companies that used um, digital currencies or electronic currencies were either the cryptocurrency, uh, startups like Bitcoin. Some others would point to um, uh, some early attempts in the 1997 to 1996 at the start of the commercial internet, particularly in, in the Netherlands, but there were in, in, in other, many other countries. Others would point to uh, uh, an experiment that um, an experiment that that failed called Mondex. However, you know you would have to go back to see exactly at what you, you could go to the 1970s to see the first instances where there was the creation of bank balances electronically only within the central bank and the banks without any type of physical representation. So it's, it's a little bit contested and, and that's part of the reason to start to look at this in a more of a long-term view and, and, and trying to define some of these, these terms. It sounds like uh, a key point of contention is whether the term refers to the consumer or to the financial institution, is, is that right? In, indeed, that, that would be another way of looking at it. And Really, you know, the, the part of the, one of the things that what it makes sense also to look at it from a long term perspective is, is that, you know, bank disintermediation really, again, started in the 1970s and the 1980s uh, when there is this shift. Uh, first, it, I think, took place in Germany then very much Paul Walker in the, in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the UK, where governments move from direct control of the money supply by establishing um, specific amounts of credit that banks could give and therefore physically limiting how much money could go in and out of the economy to what we have today, which is an indirect control of the money supply through open market operations. Um, so from, from you know, this, 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 is, this is the process through which um, banks, you know, a number of operations that were taking uh, place inside of financial institutions start to take place through open market. And technology is, is an enabler of that, but it's not the only 
reason why this sort of thing happens. Um, so I'd like to um, bring us to uh, the Hagley collections. Um, and I'd like to know uh, what Hagley collections have you used in your work and how are they useful for you? Oh, right. Um, well, if we go back to the, to the previous um, question, one of the ways that some people define the start of FinTech from a consumer perspective was the appearance or the emergence of the ATM in the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So it was precisely that work which brought me to, to Hagley. And initially, I, there, there were, uh, I was looking at some of the paperwork around IBM, that there is a very small collection uh, around one of the um, um, lawsuits uh, that the Department of Justice brought to, to IBM. And I was, I was intrigued because not being an engineer, there was this uh, interface that was coming out in all of the technical papers around ATMs. And I couldn't figure out what this, this device was, was doing. Um, so, so that was uh, the, the, what uh, started to, to, to draw, draw me into it. And what I really, what I really found um, a treasure trove, and it's something that I that it was it was very very rich, and I have been using as a background. But I I I'm planning to work more as a main study is the collection of the Philadelphia Saving Fund Society, mm. and yes. that was a collection that, as I understand it, when the when the after after the savings banks demutualized in the U.S. and the, and the PSFA. Um, was about to collapse, uh, then Hagley was very active in securing those archives, which the, the um, uh, PSFA had, if memory serves, uh, put aside, I think it was in a mine at one point in time, they, they had some of the, some of those archives were, were stored in a, in a, in a mine shaft. And, and they were brought into Hagley and uh, it was it was interesting for 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 a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that um, there's a lot of interest in the PSFA, as I understand it, from from a point of view point of view of its headquarters building. Uh, seems to to have been a, a major piece of architecture in in downtown uh, Philadelphia, and and that brings an, a number of people. Then um, my, our colleague uh, Dan Warhani had done some work on the 19th century part of the, um, of the collection. Uh, but the modern part had been um, basically untouched. And, and, and that was uh, really a very, very rich um, set of, um, of, of, of information. And it was something that I couldn't fit on its own in the book because it's really a, a, a complete story uh, because it's uh, from the point of view of, of fintech and, and from the point of view of, of changing the distribution of financial services to the um, to the um, to consumers in 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 the um, in the US it it tells you know this this coherent, harmonious story because the, 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 the archives are very, very detailed uh, going, going from the 1950s, 60s to the early 1980s. And, and let me tell you, you know, briefly what the story is. Um, uh, basically, if, if memory serves, the PSFA at, at that point in time was the biggest savings uh, bank in, in the US in terms of assets. Um, and um, I think there were about 400 uh, savings banks or mutual savings banks at, at this point in, in time, but certainly the PSFA was, was, was the biggest. Um, it was very, and I'll, I'll try to make some, some parallels or some comparisons as we go along. So to compare the development of and the workings of um, building societies in the UK, which were mortgage specialists. They, there was a similar figure in the US, but they disappeared 
in the early 19, uh, just shortly after the depression. They were called building, buildings and loans. And they were also mortgage specialists and they, they, they turned into savings and, and loans and, and are uh, diluted. Um, the work of Sebastian Fleitas and um, uh, well, the, Sebastian Fleitas and some colleagues from Arizona have done some some work around the, the disappearance of, of this institution in the in the U.S. But in the U.K. they remain, they remain even today. Although you you, you just have a handful of of them, and then they they, they have diversified. But anyway, um, this is this is uh, moving moving into into something else. Um, the the point was that here we have one of the major or a very large institution in terms of assets, but in terms of branches, they had only 67 of them. And on the other hand, European banks at this point in time might not have had the same, or, or at least the, the medium ones and the small ones, uh, might not have had the same size in terms of assets, but certainly they had thousands of, branch, of retail branches. And that was mirroring the problems of geographical diversification that the uh, McFadden and Glass-Steagall were were impinging in the in, in U.S. banks at this at this point in in time. Um, so what the story was, so it was interesting in terms of comparison of, of the size and how um, even with these restrictions they they were trying to to solve this these problems with using technology in the same in the in, in a similar way. Um, the problem for the for many U.S. banks at, at this point in time was that. Uh, people were moving out to the suburbs, and 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 malls were becoming more 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 popular. And for them to open branches and to follow their customers where the volume was uh, was very very difficult. In extreme cases, as such as unitary um, states such as the uh, Illinois, you couldn't. You know, you, you were just one branch, one bank type of type of thing. But for for states that allowed. Um, multi-state uh, branching such as California and, and uh, Pennsylvania, um, it was possible, but it was very, very expensive. It was very onerous to, to open up a new, a new branch because you had to go to so many, and, and there is mater some material of, of this in the, um, in the archives, so many jumps and, and, and hurdles that, that really, you, you, you really had to be sure where you wanted to be opening your, your branch. Uh, a glimpse, much, very, very small, but very much a watered down version of this. You find it in the TV series, um, um, uh, All About Soul, you know, the follow-up from Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. uh, where the mm -hmm. fiance of the hero is working for this uh, uh, small bank, in medium-sized bank in, 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 in in the southwest and she's in charge of opening up a number of branches and she's a, 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 a lawyer specializing in, in this anyway if you want to see it in a more tv type of, of sense the point then is that um atms or or following the the, the customer is is important and finding ways to to do it in some form of flexible way it's also important and the restriction even if you are allowed the time that it would take to to be able to create a presence uh would would you know it was a it was a major investment so the the, the psfa as other savings banks in in for example ohio uh what they first do or is is that they try to open up um some form of of presence within supermarkets. Um, and, and this is more or less at the same time that ATMs are appearing. But, but ATMs were, um, they had a number of problems. Among, among others, they were very expensive. So for somebody like the PSFA, or uh, as a representative of other savings banks, this was not really a cost-effective solution. So they, they tried to- When would this have been? I'm sorry to interrupt, but when, when would this have been? Uh, we're talking uh, early 1970s. Okay, okay. And, and this part of the story is really 
throughout the 1970s. So okay. as, um, uh, or if just, just to put it in a step backwards, banks in both sides of the Atlantic had been trying to find alternatives to, to uh, for different reasons to, to retail bank branch distribution throughout the 20th century. As far back as the 19, uh, yeah, I mean, just just as a, I mean, there are ideas and there are, and there, there is evidence of both ideas in terms of you know there are um, a patent from 1924, which was the first time that I that you see in the patent record uh, linking um, financial services and a car. There is this tube type of system, and you, your Model T. Uh, next to it, yeah, in, in trying to <laughs> yeah. to say, hey, look, you know, you you can bring both of them together. Uh, but you know, in the 1930s, for example, uh, already in in the Netherlands and in the UK, you have uh, branches in on cars. So basically, they they take trucks and they modify the trucks to uh, primarily go and service agricultural. Uh, customers yes mm -hmm. and, and that is to bring the the bank closer to the to the to the customer so there is and there are others which which uh, you know with the development of technology you always have things that work and things that did not work the atm is one of those that that did work uh this this um uh these little branches that we were talking about uh they basically had two or three issues um, one of them was that they used a very um, weak, in terms of security system, to cash checks. That's what they were doing, yeah. Um, and and that was to give uh, to use money from the from the um, uh, supermarket to uh, what we today you can do with your debit card at the the cash register. Yeah, uh, but instead of doing it in the, the, the cash register, could not do that. So you you had this little island in the middle of the of the um, of the supermarket where you had two or a couple of people servicing and basically cashing checks, accepting deposits if you want to, but mainly the the purpose was was to cash checks. And they they the PSFA um, makes an alliance with uh, the, the, the name of the supermarket chain just, just escapes because they, they just uh, actually went, um, they just went bankrupt um, in the last, within the last six months or, or, or so. It was a family owned um, firm, uh, very long established in, in Philadelphia uh, with the, 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 the name will come back in a moment. Um, anyway, um, so for about, Five, eight years, the PSFA tried to make this system kind of work. Uh, and as I said, it was not alone. Other or the savings banks were, were trying to make it work as, as well. But basically, by the early 1980s, if memory serves, it was 1981, which, which makes sense from an ATM industry perspective, because that's when the volume of ATMs actually picks up in the UK. Uh, very, very importantly, um, you know, the, the ATM have developed and, and, uh, and basically the amount of um, uh, the amount of losses being uh, uh, faced with this system as it was not, you know, really resilient is not making it cost effective. And, and there is something else which is not clear from the archives. I, I think that there is some so movement within the, the organization or some, some change of heart. And, and basically after resisting for, for about 10 years, they, they go on and they establish uh, the first ATM, well, they, they buy into the first ATM network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you can see, the archives are very, very rich in providing the, if you want to the strategy, the thinking, within the, the, the financial institutions and evaluating the pros and the cons of, of sticking to this and trying to make it work, going to, to other, um, to other um, uh, supermarket chains to see if, you know, 
is it worth it can can we control it and in the background you have the regulatory issue when when the uh, you know when the, 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 the state government of, of Pennsylvania starts to say, well, you know, this might be bank branches. So you might have to ask us permission to, to open, you know, one of this. And, and again, there is um, around this time, I think it was 1984, there is a, a Supreme Court ruling um, establishing that the ATM is not a bank branch and therefore is not subject to um, to the same type of uh, of regulation or state regulation, and therefore should be able, you know, financial institutions should be able to de deploy it more more freely because it was it was the, the, the uh, obviously there was an, an argument around this that that goes all the way up as there was inconsistency in, in the way that some states were were dealing with this problem. So cost uh, sounds like cost was a driving factor in on the supply side in encouraging. Uh, financial institutions to adopt automatic cash dispensing uh, technology. Um, uh, what then perhaps was it like uh, for the consumer? Um, what drives the growing ubiquity of ATMs in the, the built environment of the average person? Yes. Um, well, it was not only cost, but it was also understanding the technology. And if you want to make a simul, for example, with blockchain or with bitcoin when when people were saying no bitcoin or or some of the cryptocurrencies should become mainstream you know there's not a lot of people that the cryptocurrencies have been around what it's going to be 10 years since the nakamoto paper for for bitcoin yeah you don't have really you only now start to have a number of people that kind of understand the technology and kind of understand what you're talking about and um, yeah so it's not only the cost of the of the of the item, but is how are we going to make it work? Um, in in the case of of Vibol made an alliance with um, Chubb, in which was a UK company, to take their plants and and, and develop and, and deploy um, Chubb design machines in the US. Um, but uh, very often, you know, this, this was a very short-lasted um, um, alliance. I, I, I argue that there, were, there was a legal case, but we'll, we'll put that aside. Uh, from a practical perspective, it came to a point where you had to fly engineers from the UK to the US to be able to repair the machine. And that, that is not really, it's not really cost effective. It's not the way that things are gonna work out, no? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and anyway, um, from the, for the consumer, um, it also takes a long time because it was um, cumbersome. It was not something that you're used to. It was something that they had to be convinced. It was very much a, a banks pulling um, pulling the, the, the consumer into using the, the device and in, in, in this process uh, making sure that the device works with any technology uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example in a, in a, in a moment um, in any technology you know things can go wrong especially in the early stages yeah there are things that you don't know. There are risks. There are ways in, in the, the way that the technology, especially when it's rolling out, is it might or not behave. It's the same case with the vaccine for COVID these days, for example. Uh, I don't know if you've read any of the, for example, the interviews for this uh, Oxford science, the, the, the lady that is guiding the Oxford um, effort. And she said, well, let, let's see how things work out when it's industrialized. And let's see if we can you know, replicate it at that scale and, and how are we going to distribute it. It's, so it's not only just having the thing, it's making it work in a, in a large scale that, 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 uh, that has its own thing. And, and this concept of appropriation where people find other ways to engage in the, with the technology that engineers did not uh, forecast. Yeah? 
Um, uh, a sim very simple example around the ATM was a customer coming in to the branch manager and complaining that they had repainted the fascia of the of the machine. So he now had forgotten his his um, uh, personal identification number, which he had written on top of the machine because he was always using the same one. You know, kind of, <laughs> kind of, uh, kind of things. But um, so so for 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 consumers, it was it was creating familiarity and creating trust and creating um, you know a, a, an example an anecdote an, an, an anecdote that I've heard. Uh, happening in South Africa and in the US and in the UK and in a number of countries is what, that when, when the machines are being starting to roll out, um, people would go put in their, their card, check their balance, yeah? Um, um, these were early machines, so they would take the, the card out. They would put the card in again, take out the money, yes, take the car out, put the card in again and then print the balance again and making sure that the two print statements are reflecting what the money that they have been given. Yeah. And at, at this, this happens, I told you different geographies and at different um, point, points in time, but at the point where the machine is being, is being rolled out. Um, and, and, and um, you know, there, there is all sorts of, all sorts of um, things. One, one of the things that in the book, I, I go into some detail in explaining this, is around um, a TV commercial from um, um, a, a medium-sized bank that is now part of Sun, Sun I think it's Sun Bank or Sun Alliance. Yes, um, they, they are um, Midwest, Midwest, South, Southern East, Southern East uh, states kind of, uh, because they, they were based in Tennessee uh, and, and again uh, in a similar way to uh, the PSFA, their main office in central um, uh, in, in the central town is a, it's a major piece of architecture that, that happens with the, with the banks because one of the ways that they want to express that they are trustworthy is through the materiality of their buildings yeah um, so um, anyway, so so they create a. It, it's very much what sociologists call Disney Disneyification of society. They create a cartoon character uh, that it was Tammy the Tammy the teller, yeah. Uh, they give they gave her a particular um, aspect and colors and whatever have you, and they replicate these colors and these things around the ATMs and what the uh advert does is it play this is why it's part of the group because it, it, it plays with many of these ideas it it, it has it, within the same advert um a space within the suburbs a space within downtown um uh, in the downtown then it, it, it starts to show uh or there appears uh women who are professionists yes and and interestingly they are playing with a Tammy is blonde, yes, but in this part of the advert that you, that you have the two uh, working women, one of them is black and the other one is, is white on, on the side of, and, and at the end of the advert, they go into the mobile uh, banking aspect of, of uh, you know, the, the drive-through aspect, which was very big in the, in the States and still is in, the, in some of the southern, southern uh, States of the U.S. Um, drive-through banking is still big, you know. Um, so it was, you know, in a, in a one in 30 seconds turned out to be about 30 pages of just going around and seeing, you know, this. What are all of these things, and what does it mean for the for the consumer? It means familiarity. It means, you know, banks trying to to play. How do we make this uh, more amenable? How do we entice you to to use it? Yes. What are we Selling in terms of selling in terms of how do we convince you to for you to interact? Um, how do we solve questions and, and issues? And as I said at the beginning, something that is not evident, but it's there is how are we going to manage and distinguish between the times that the technology goes wrong 
and that the customer is is has done you know that the error is on the side of the of the customer and and that is that is a very thin line because in the case of atms um you if i tell you that i didn't get the the, the withdrawal or not all the money came came out there is a way cumbersome that you can that you can check it which is going and counting whatever is left on the on the machine check it against the tally and then i can give you your money if it's not if not uh, there but from the point of view of the consumer of the consumer especially when a time that you have your relationship is with your branch not with a brand of the bank but with your branch um if i tell you and, and, and especially in anglo-saxon countries if i come and i tell you that something has gone wrong and i didn't get it i'm, I'm i fundamentally believe myself to be honest and if you don't believe me then you are challenging one of my core beliefs and that is going to put our relationship in in you know it's going to strain it but once that happens you know i can go and tell my my friend my compadre listen this happened and then my compadre is going to go and say oh i you know i, I made a withdrawal and i didn't get money and then you're going to have a queue of people uh claiming that they've made a withdrawal and and they didn't get their money so you 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 know, there, there, there are a number of things that you how are you going to manage this and 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 how are you going to um deal with it and you see it in the history of or in the way that banks um work uh, and deal with uh, with customers now time and again so in the uh, now with with cyber crime for example um some some banks in some countries have been very good at um investing in artificial intelligence or algorithms that will detect when there is a transaction that is uh, uh you know significantly out of normal for for a certain um customer and and uh, they they might be proactive talk to the at least it has been my personal experience as well you know receiving a call from the bank questioning a transaction some cases it was because i was staying for a conference sometimes you know i was in in the us uh and the transaction had taken place in singapore um you don't recognize it and from the point of view of the bank it's cheaper or at least some banks think that to deal with that and assume the loss of a small transaction and and having the customer continue to use the, your your digital channels yeah as opposed to what happens for example here in latin america um where you know if you get hacked or if you that trans of some or of there is fraud then it's your problem and the bank is not going to you know going to going to uh do anything to help you uh or it doesn't do largely don't doesn't do anything to help you. The, the result is that you have very very little use of digital channels in in latin america proportionately speaking certainly much less than than you would like them to to have than in other parts of the world no but but it's this this thing of how do you engage with the with the customers how do you make them trust the the channel and more importantly how are you going to deal with, with when when things go go wrong and and to what extent are you able to support um and and able to assume losses to to change uh, consumer behavior and i'll give you uh, just to, to to finish this this aspect uh, another um um very quick anecdote and in the case of spain uh, what is called caixa bank these days used to be la caixa which is a barcelona based um savings bank that which now has turned turned commercial one of the one of the three today is one of the three largest domestic banks in 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 spain but when they were rolling out their atms they didn't have person, personal identification number you just put in the card and and that's it and and uh they said well how could you do that i mean the 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 manufacturers were saying well you're going to have 
a very, very great number of losses. Uh, and the, the bank says that ultimately it was better for them to teach and to create this confidence, particularly around elderly consumers to interact with the, with the devices. And then they introduce the personal identification number than putting another barrier. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, a little bit like Jeff Bezos saying that for every extra click that you have to give in Amazon, they lose 50% of their sales. You know? So you remove that, that extra click at least to, to, to begin with. So, but, but, so for the consumers, it was, you know, um, it, it also depends where, where, where you're talking. Well, not, well, because the 1980s is, is a time where a very large number of, of people, even in, in developed countries, were uh, bankerized. Um, in this case, your grandparents might, might, uh, might not have, you know, they might have had a savings account. They, they might have had an account to uh, save for their mortgage, but they didn't have a current account. They certainly have a personal checking account. In, in the US, it might be a little bit different, but in many other countries, you know, people didn't have a, um, they didn't interact with the, with the banks. The, and banks didn't want to lose this group of consumers to, to new entrants. So technology is again important in being able to deal with this large number of consumers while not clogging up the, the, the retail bank branch system, which was unable to, to cater for, for all of them. In you know, around the 90, late 1970s, early 1980s, going to the bank was, was you know, you would, to cash your, your paycheck, you know, you would basically lose the whole afternoon because you would have to queue and, and very often, you know, those, those queues would go around the corner. So this is automation allow financial institutions to allocate. Sorry, could you repeat the question because it, it didn't come very... Uh, this is automation, automation of services allow financial institutions to reallocate labor to uh, to to other jobs, jobs and employees. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Your the last part of the question is is I don't know why the we were you were listening to me okay, but somehow your um, mic is coming. Did automation of banks allow? Right. Yes. Uh, automation was essential to allow banks to to grow and provide um, bulk volume uh, business. And for retail banking, that was critical. And and that's a history unto itself, going back from um, or going all the way back to the 1950s. Uh, because to, to be able to, you know, make a transaction on your telephone today, uh, among other things, all of, your, all of your data, all of your records had to be digitalized and has to be, uh, you know, you have to be able to access it in a, in a very speedy way. And, and that took very, very long time to happen. And even, and even today, uh, or in the last, couple of years, uh, although the, the, this, the, this, the interest has died down a little bit, and certainly COVID has, has changed the, the, the priorities for self-service banking. Um, the, the goal or the nirvana was to provide something that was called the omni-channel. And, and this omni-channel was this idea was coming from retailing that you could uh, interact with your bank as a consumer whenever you want it through whichever channel that you choose and you should be able to change channels midway should you choose yeah so you could start with your mobile and then for whatever reason you can finish with your pc or with your ipad or atm whatever um that was the pers the, the from the con consumer perspective but for the bank you know, a large number of banks didn't even attempt it. 
among other things because you have a lot of legacy, you have a lot of this uh, information, is, it's digitalized, but it's in separate uh, databases, some of it for organizational reasons, some of it for regulatory reasons. So being able to create the bridges to, to provide this seamless experience while also maintaining the, the brand of the, of the bank was going, you know, was very, being very, very expensive. That sort of points in the direction of um, something I found really interesting in your book and some of the implication perhaps of your work. Um, well, I guess my question is, how does the history of um, uh, cash machines, cash dispensing machines, point us toward a cashless society? Right. Okay. Um, neither cash machines, neither banks themselves are a destination on themselves. They're, they're an intermediary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, in the same way that the ATM and cash, if you want to, are technologies that are therefore a bridge between destinations. Mm -hmm. So this is a, you know, it's a, it's a picture, if you want to, in, in time where, where we see this process evolving and making the argument that um, in this industry, innovation is, is incremental, it's, it's, it's not revolutionary, it's very slow, it takes a long time to, to, to happen. And just by very simply, um, you know, takes 15 years, 10, 15 years for the ATM from inception in 1957, and even early, because you, you can see some, some people thinking about it slightly early, but anyway, um, to becoming mainstream in the early 1980s. So it takes you know, 10, 15 years for the technology to, to mature. Yeah? Uh, and that is, and, and becoming mainstream. And it's only until recently that although a lot of journalists have questioned the, the, the longevity of the ATM, and the, uh, uh, that it's only until recently that you really see the number of deployment plateauing or coming down in some countries um, in terms of number of ATMs per number of in inhabitants, because it's difficult to, to compare. Although I think, I think you're, you're not comparing apples and apples. Um, uh, you're, you would be comparing apples and pears otherwise. But cash machines are much more than just cash. Yes, they go hand in hand. Certainly in, in, in the West, they, they go hand in hand. But that's because um, consumers are used to uh, engaging with three or four types of transactions. If you see the type of transactions and the number of transactions that ATMs had in the 1980s, it was you know, 10 times what you have today. Well, not, I don't know, 10 times. Yeah, maybe 50, 50 types of transactions. In the same way that the same machine today is able to do 200 types of transactions or 100 types of transactions in China. Yeah? So it's not a question only of what the, what the device can do. It's a question of what the banks want to do and what consumers are used to, to, to doing. Um, cash machines in most developed countries Today are the main point of distribution of, of cash, but they're not all of the same kind. You know, you have from the very simple ones that you can find in a corner shop or in a pub or a bar that will only do that. You know, give you cash, give you your balance if you want to, um, to the self-service devices that are used by medium-sized and small business. That, that involve you know, a number of other more sophisticated, sophisticated type of, of transactions. And, and, and actually now during COVID, this type of more sophisticated type of machine are the ones that have held the, the, the ground, that are, are the ones that have you know, given the, the brunt of, of, of transactions because those are the ones that have remained open. And those are the ones that you know, their use has been much more intense than than before. It is the other ones, the smaller ones, that that have become idle, 
Um, so in terms of the cashless society, um, it will be, you know, too adventurous to think that cash is going to be there forever. Um, but um, it's also in the same way, you know, it's not going to, to, to disappear and we're going through a process of change. And in, you know, there are elements in the short term that would, you know, that are pointing in both directions. Yeah. Um, as you know, you, you have evidence of some people hoarding cash in the same way that some people, the reduction of cash dropped very uh, steeply in some, in some aspects or in some, some countries, but then it has come back up, up again. Um, and, and you're facing in a longer term um, what might be a, a, a structural change in the sense that, you know, it's easy to say or to think, well, this is the end of cash with, with, with COVID, yeah? Uh, but by the same token, if, if we continue to have the levels of unemployment and these levels of unemployment are, are persistent or even grow in, you know, the, the, you know, the, some of the fiscal stimulus are about to end in, in, in Europe as well. They just ended in the, in the, in the US. Uh, a number of people are likely to go back to a cash economy. They might lose access to their, to their, to their bank, they might lose, you know, their 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 housing. That is that is a possibility. So instead of, you know, yes, this has favored some some uh, online commerce, but at the same way, you might have just around the corner things that are going to go in in the op totally opposite direction. People not being able to afford their, their you know a, a mobile contract. Uh, so let alone being being able to, and you know their debit card, they do the relationship with their bank. So it's not, it's not clear if, if anything, COVID has, um, I think, made that trend to cashless open it, made, made it wide open to see where, where things might, might uh, come or, or it might, you know, they might come back to the same trend, but uh, after a big slump, uh, it's, not, it's not clear where, where the, the, the long-term changes are going to, are going to be because it was, it was also not clear how much how long this is going to it is going to last. Uh, of course, if you ask somebody in fintech, they will say, "Well, cash is dead and it's dirty, and we're not going to see anything of it." But but you know, I think our role as academics is trying to to be not fencing, but trying to see uh, both sides of the argument and and um, and, and see that. Uh, Yes, there, there, there is a trend for cashless, but it, from we've talked a, lot, a little bit about uses, but also in terms of consumers, there is a number of consumers that live in a cash economy, and there is a reason for these consumers to live in a cash economy, and others who, you know, particularly vulnerable consumers that would, you know, you you have to find devices or otherwise or or ways to bring them along, otherwise you're you're gonna Expel them, or expel them from the from the from the system. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's why. The, yeah, sorry. The the key question then becomes cashless for whom? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Cashless for whom? Or and and uh, for for what reason? Well, what is it that you know? If you're not using cash, and that's you know, so you don't use it or use it very little. In, in 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 Latin America, it's uh you know you have 50 percent of the economy that that it's outside of the formal sector, and that's a very much a cash economy, and you cannot go around Latin American countries if if without cash. Simple as that. Well, I, I do have one more question for you, and sure. I, I want to know. Um, what you consider the significance of Hagley and the Hagley collections from an international perspective? Oh, super. No, Hagley is like, a, well, probably I'm, I'm going to be over the top, but saying that it's a little oasis in the desert, but I wouldn't say that. It's certainly, it's, it's critical and it's essential for anybody who has done business history to, to, to come to Hagley and to see the collections and it's, it's rare, I think, of any of the 
colleagues not to have found something that is of interest for them at Hackley, as well as um, the experience of being in, in Hagley and being able to work in the archives and you being in the whole setting, it, it's part of it. Um, and I, it's very, very important. And, and the work that Hackley does in, in promoting uh, uh, historical work and interaction with other aspects is, has always been very much, you know, at the, at the crest of the, of the, of the way. So, so it is a reference that you know, whoever is in this business and is not, not keeping an eye of what is happening at Hackley, then, then they're not in the game. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> well, Bernardo, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you about your work. It's my pleasure. And thank you very much for, for reaching out. Uh, absolutely. Take care. You too.